to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Notice with me verse 32. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 32. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. I'm going to read that again. Amen. I know you know that verse. I know that verse. We love this verse. But do we live it? And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Now please turn with me to Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 55, Isaiah chapter 55, and let's notice a few verses together, beginning with verse 6. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found, call, upon, call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord. And he will have mercy upon him and to our God, and for he will abundantly pardon. I say, he will abundantly pardon. Amen. Notice verse 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. And my thoughts than your thoughts. May I tell you, this book, the Word of God, the Bible, God breathed Word for you and I, from Genesis to Revelation, is the good news. Amen. The good news. Last week, you heard me say good news a lot. I got to where I just like to say it. Good news. I've got good news. Amen. I don't know about you, but I like to tell people the good news. I like to bear good news. Amen. And you know, I can tell you, when you want to talk a lot about good news, you cannot leave out forgiveness. Some of what we just heard already this morning, some of how the Lord has ministered to you through some of the testimonies that you've heard and some of the, even some of the special music that has been sung, we are reminded that we have been forgiven much. I am, I am more thankful for the good news of the gospel for knowing that I'm on my way to heaven, every time I stop and consider what I have been rescued from, Amen. may I tell you, if we don't revisit and remind ourselves and remember where we're from and then be able to rejoice in a greater way in where we're going, many folks aren't going to get this. As a matter of fact, you know how the world is. You know what the world thinks. The world thinks that Christians think that they're all pretty good people, pretty much, and they've always been pretty good folks, and uh, they're a little bit better than everybody else because they also are saved, and, and that's how the world takes what the, the media and everybody else uh, tries to sell them. May I tell you, you have to <laughs> understand that for each and every one of us, sin is tragic and it's grievous. That's right. There's so much that you and I have been forgiven. And if we don't get that, if we don't understand that, and if we move away from understanding that or, or, or living in that, we make a huge mistake. I, some of our language, for example, some of my favorite songs, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Amen? I, I want to sing it right now, but I won't. I will say you that in my mind I can hear I sound just like the cathedrals. <laughs> All four guys. And I think three of them were in glory. May I tell you, we're not just sinners. We are hideous, filthy, rotten, no good, low down, stinking sinners. Now, that may not fit in some circles, in some of our dignified circles where we just say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, okay, okay, I'm willing to concede. Okay, if you want me to, all right, all right, all right. Since my wife's standing here, yes. Yes, okay, yes, 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 I've sinned a little bit. Okay, you got it? No, that's not it, man. We are, I mean, when we, when we recognize that our past sins, our present sins, and 
Yes, thanks be to God. Our future sins are forgiven. We better remember what sin is. And we better remember how much we have been forgiven. For if you can't tell people about the forgiveness of sin, then you don't get the good news. You know, Brother Jaime just shared that in, uh, in prison ministry, and thanks be to God for prison ministry, uh, he has seen souls saved, he has seen lives changed. I'll tell you what, a dead man walking to, uh, taking that final walk uh, to receive a needle in his arm who knows Jesus Christ is better off than the most affluent human being on this planet apart from Jesus Christ. That's right. And for anyone who might say, well, you know what, those folks are way bigger and better sinners than we are, and, and uh, boy, it's a good thing they got saved because they sure are messed up. You don't get it. You don't understand, my friend. For all have sinned. Right. And I'm sure they the great God. And you know, even as Brother Will shared that he has a burden for not only our youth, but our young adults that are coming up. By the way, man, just saying, it was so neat. I got to go out there and hear a great message preached and, and got to see some of our, 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 our seniors. You know, Remember last week he said, by the way, seniors are invited, and I thought he was talking about me. I'm 55 now. <laughs> but he was talking about seniors in high school, okay? And so they were able to go out there, and, and, and this was, I, I, I must say, officially their first adult uh, opportunity to, to be involved in a, in a ministry where they're being recognized as adults. And we don't want it to be their last. We don't want this to be something that just was their their bye-bye uh, opportunity. We want them to draw closer to the Lord now. In your 20s, uh, in your late teens, get a hold of the Lord and don't let go. But I'll tell you, newsflash, they are sinners that need to know the Lord just like everybody and anybody else. You know, we use some fancy words when it comes to sin. We, uh, first of all, I'm, I'm going to go through some of those words. They, in my contract, it says use the 85 cent words that way people know you're a pastor. Okay? So you ready? Actually, it's $1.10 now with inflation. Ready? <laughs> all of us are guilty of sins of commission. Sins of commission. Well, what are we talking about? <laughs> well, let me think. Sins of commissions? Commission, that would be sins that we commit, that we do, that we actually go out and do. Whether it be something that you've planned on, prepared for, for a long, long time, or you just, boom, it happens, it is a sin that you commit. You know, can I tell you, many of us, would say that, yes, this is an area of my life that I know I continue to struggle in. For the born-again Christian who recognizes that, that it, it breaks the Lord's heart that he might consent, commit a particular sin and he continues to commit that sin, it's grievous to him. And he may even resolve not to do it anymore. And he finds himself continuing to commit whatever that sin might be. Listen, there's a, there's a, there's a spot for you to fill in what you know that sin is for you in your life. But you know there is also, and each and one of us are guilty of this, sins of omission. Sins of omission. Well, if you omit, that means it didn't happen. Sins of omission are those sins that are committed when we ought to do what we know we ought to do and what the Lord would have us to do and we don't do it. You know, I learned a long time ago that you cannot beat people in to serve in the Lord. You cannot beat right. people in to right. pray. You cannot <laughs> guilt right. people in to share the good news of Jesus Christ. But I will tell you this, and I, and I, I, I just want to say this without apology. It is sin. When we don't spend time in prayer. It is sin. You know, we, we mostly talk this way today. You know, it's a good idea to pray. I highly recommend that you pray. Pray. Because it's good for you. No, you don't get it. 
The truth is, if we don't pray, that's sin. If we're not, if, if we're not recognizing the importance of, of, of coming together and, <coughs> and spending time in God's house, that's sin. If, if we're not reading our Bible, yes, it really is true. Now, I know this is old-fashioned preaching, the kind of preaching that some of our parents and grandparents used to hear and believe, but it's sin when we don't do these things. It's so much more trendy, and it's easier today to say, oh, if you don't do this, then you won't enjoy that. And if you don't do that, then you won't have the blessing of this. As a matter of fact, we are cautiously now, even as pastors and preachers, very careful to say, hey, listen, don't do that because then you won't be blessed. How about this? That's sin. Yeah. Yeah. That is sin. Now, I know if you got on television with all the rest of those spin meisters and talking heads and you just said, we don't do this because we believe it's sin, you're going to be considered archaic. Mm -hmm. Somebody from the past. You're, you're going to be dismissed and laughed at. i got to tell you something. The real truth is, we're probably, and I'm thinking especially with this uh, crowd here, we're more guilty of the sins of omission than we are of the sins of commission. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is true. You can, you can maybe not be involved in some of the over-the-top terrible things that are going on today, uh, that people are actively and, and, and tragically overly involved in. Of course, there's no such thing as overly involved, really. If you're involved, it's, it's wrong. But, you know, <coughs> the truth is we've got good folks who stay home. We've got good folks who aren't be serving who aren't serving. We've got, if you will, good folks who ought to spend more time in prayer, but they find themselves filling their schedule with other things. And we don't think of that kind of sin as really tragic and grievous and terrible sin. As a matter of fact, I've got to tell you, I've got a problem with many people who, 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 who look over at this group or that group and they say, you know, look at that person over there. They're, they're struggling with drugs or alcohol. Uh, I've never had that problem. And, and these people over here, they're involved in, in sexual promiscuity and, and uh, even things more hideous than that. So they're, they're more sinful than we are. Oh, yes, yes, willing to concede and confess. Yes, I'm a sinner. You know, until your heart's broken over your sin, right. you can't fully appreciate the good news. You can't fully understand what it means to, 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 to realize that these terrible, hideous, rotten, grievous nasty sins that we have all committed. These are the sins that sent our Savior to the cross. I want to mention another sin. The sin of disposition. What am I talking about there? Now that's a, that's a dollar twenty-five cent word right there. The sin of disposition is that, is that high, haughty attitude that we can get. That we can find ourselves you know, in kind of that rooster kind of way uh, trotting around and very proudly boasting how we're not as bad as everybody else. As a matter of fact, even some of the things that we're doing aren't causing as much trouble as, as maybe some of the things that other people are doing. May I tell you that that little lie at work or that dismissive comment that you made about uh, a family member or a brother or sister is hideous, terrible, and wrong, and it's sin. When we, when we kind of, you know, shrug off, you know, the importance of, of using the right language, and we think, hey, look, let's just casually, you know, fall into the same vulgarity that everybody else has fallen into, and we treat it like it's no big deal, and that it's okay, we are wrong. It's a tragedy. Just recently, I saw something written about cussing. You know, the word cussing even itself sounds like something. Oh, that's something. Oh, that guy was cussing, let me tell you. And we think it's kind of funny. But that's sinful and wrong. Right, right. And, and you know, there are even now certain circles, even certain preachers from pulpits that are using 
crass and vulgar language, and they think it's appropriate and okay. Right. Have you ever noticed how when the music becomes more crass and casual and worldly, it doesn't take very long before the preaching follows right along with that's that. Right. Have you ever noticed that? And you know, I can tell you that today there are many seminaries that are teaching that unless you know about every single movie star and every single television program and all the trendy things that all the kids are doing, you can't preach today because you'll not be able to meet them where they're at. I'm here to tell you that is wrong. I just got to believe that when our young adults were able to gather together out of Camp Loma de Vida, they were able to hear from a man of God, a preacher who preached against sin. Loving them and loving the Lord did not compromise, did not back away, did not back down. Now, I'm not saying that we're going to stick our heads in the sand and not be aware of some of the concerns of the day. Of course not. Absolutely not. But if you think you've got to know the most trendy and latest uh, way to say this or that or do this or that, you are, you're never going to stay caught up. I can tell you that, first of all. Uh, about the first time you think, if you're over 30, that uh, you're cool because you say this or that, the kids are already looking at you and going, oh, we quit saying that last week. Okay, so can you stop, please? So how about this? Preach the word of God. Love those that you preach to and let them know how passionate and how excited you are about the gospel. Last week when we talked about the gospel, the gospel, the gospel, the gospel, we wanted it to be clear that it is good news. And my friends, I'm happy to say that if we don't understand that, yes, forgiveness is very much a part of what the gospel is all about, it's probably because we're not fully remembering or appreciating how terrible sin is. How absolutely disgusting it is. Sin affects people. Sin is destructive. Sin causes people to fear death and eternity. There are those who will laugh in your face and they'll scoff, yet in their heart and in their spirit they know, I know I can't continue to do this and get away with it. Maybe I, I'm at least fooling myself into believing nobody else understands or gets what I'm doing, but I know that I am. And if there is a God, I think ultimately something's going to be happening to me. That's the heart. That's where we're really at. But you know what? Even for those of us who have trusted Christ as Savior, we now, we foolishly talk ourselves into believing that I can manage all of this. I can work it all out. You know, I may be struggling a little bit with pornography over here, but nobody knows. It's just this little thing that isn't hurting anybody, and, and uh, you don't have to go downtown, and, and, you don't have, and, and nothing's going to happen. But in the back of your mind, you're saying, I know in my heart of hearts, first of all, what it's doing to me in my spirit and my heart. And I secondly understand that it is affecting my family. How many of you know of men and women serving in the church who have fallen in to, uh, you just name it, I mentioned pornography. I, I, I can tell you, we could probably have 40 or 50 people stand up right now and name a, a pastor or a deacon or uh, some leadership in the church uh, where someone ran off with somebody else's wife. I mean, these are the kinds of things that we hear too much about. And of course, we're going to hear more about that than those who are just continuing to serve and do the right thing and move ahead for Christ. We know that. We understand that. Uh, let me just say, I, I want to confess before all of you that I am actually running around with the church secretary. <laughs> Her name is Anita Miller, amen? <laughs> and I might as well just give Tommy up. He's running around with the other same area, amen? <laughs> but you know what? The truth is, we have watered down, we have homogenized sin. So why do you think it is? 
The, the good news doesn't matter that much. When they're told that homosexuality is just a lifestyle choice, when the world continues to flaunt that you can say and do anything you want and it's okay, and you come along and you, you backwards, crazy, old-timer, with old-timer attitudes, you're going to tell me that this is sin? Nobody else in the world thinks it's sin except a few of you knucklehead, narrow-minded people over there. If you don't call sin, sin, what are you going to then tell them that they're rescued from? Mm -hmm. What will happen then? I'll tell you, Isaiah, Isaiah understood what sin was. In Isaiah chapter 43, verse 25, we read, I, even I, am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for mine own sake and will not remember thy sins. How many of you, I mean, just take yourself back. How many of you remember that day when you trusted Christ as Savior and you realized, I am forgiven. I am forgiven. My sins are blotted out. And you know, maybe now the years have gone by whether we're talking about a few years or a lot of years. And, and we say now, yes, I, I, I'm saved, I'm on my way to heaven. But we don't stop and revisit the fact that there was a time that we were able to say, I did not make the mistake of escaping so great a salvation. I recognize that I was a sinner in need of a Savior. And today, thanks God, thanks be to God, I am saved. I like what Ezekiel chapter 33, 11 says. Say unto them, as I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Your neighbor, your friend, your family, your workmate, your, your school friend, this is for all of them. God doesn't take any pleasure in the death of the wicked, but he wants them to turn. The scripture goes on to say, Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will ye die, O house of Jerusalem? May I tell you, this is still true today. But that's why I say, when we're going to rejoice in the good news and the gospel, and we're going to share the good news, we're going to share the good news, we've got to remember that if we leave out sin, we have not really shared the gospel. The psalmist rejoice. <laughs> oh, I love this psalm. I, I say that a lot, don't I? Usually my favorite verse is the last one I read. <laughs> psalm 103. Blessed is the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Oh, forgiveth all thine iniquity. I'm, I'm sorry, who? <laughs> who forgiveth all thine iniquities? But well, we know who. Our Lord does. Who has all thy diseases? Who healeth all thy diseases? Who redeemeth thy life from destruction? Who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies? People cannot fully appreciate what forgiveness is until they see really themselves for who they are and what will be forgiven. I mean, look at the package here. Everything is forgiven, my friend. Everything is forgiven. Everything is forgiven. And may I say this, if you're here today and you know Christ is your Savior, you need to walk in newness of life. You need to walk in the Spirit and not in the flesh. You need to let people see that you're walking as a forgiven man. You need to let people know that you're still in a humble, thankful way appreciating all that has been forgiven. That's why when people see you confess sin and give God all the glory and, and they understand that it's not that you're perfect 
but that your pardon, it makes a difference. Acts chapter 10, verse 43. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. You know, if, if we're not fully understanding what that means, we are missing a lot. So let's just take a quick look at really what it means. What does it mean? First of all, through forgiveness, God lets us get right with himself. Now, I've heard people say this over and over again. Well, you know, I, I, I'm just, uh, I know I need to get right with God. You know, can you, can you imagine how crazy it is to say that? In the future tense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I need to get right with God. What are you talking about? You better get right with God. And that's what happens when you trust Christ as Savior. Isaiah 64 verse 6 says, But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. My friends, when you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, and yes, for many of you who have known him for many years, rejoice today. Remember what happened. You have the opportunity. The most important decision that you ever made was to trust Christ, and that's how you get right with God. You don't get right with God by the things that you do. It's by what he does in you. And so... When you understand his forgiveness, when you trust him as Savior, that is the way you get right with God. Now, what do you need to do? You need to get saved early in life, and you need to walk with the Lord for the rest of your life. And you need to say, you know, if there's sin in my life that I need to confess, I'm going to confess it. And I'm going to make sure that this slate is clean. And don't you love that our God is a God of second chances? Don't you love so much how your God says, I love you, I love you, and I want you to be drawn closer to me. I want to have a relationship with you that sin is in the middle of. Take that sin out of the way so that you can draw closer to him. Quickly, through forgiveness, and that's the focus today, salvation in Jesus Christ is the first most important appreciation for understanding what forgiveness is all about because Jesus Christ will forgive your sin. We see through forgiveness, God leads us to the right, uh, to get right with one another. First of all, we get right with the Lord. Secondly, we get right with one another. Now, i got to tell you something. If in fact that is the case, then why do we have men and women of God that are fighting with one another? Why do we have uh, husbands and wives who are born again Christians who are getting divorced? Why do we have children who made a decision for Christ, who served him for a number of years, now move in another direction and move away from the Lord? What has happened? It is not that this isn't true. It is not that it doesn't apply. It's that we're not walking in it. When you have trusted Christ as Savior, when you're right with the Lord, I am talking about your, your vertical relationship with Him. It will affect your horizontal relationship with every other born-again believer. Every time I see someone who's beside themselves and always bothered by the other guy and what he said or she said or they're doing, or, and, and you may even have some, some legitimate gripes. Oh, I should have said concerns. But the truth is, when your relationship's right with the Lord, all this other stuff doesn't overwhelm you. It doesn't take control of you. You understand that our relationship with each other is all based on forgiveness. I can tell you the, the prayer that we find is a model and a tool to use for our own lives. It's still true today. Matthew chapter 6, verse 12. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if ye forgive men your 
your trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. How can we say we're thankful for our salvation and still be odd, odd with the brethren? How can we still uh, be making a list and checking it twice and looking at how if I ever get a chance, I'm going to get that guy back. How can we have national pastors uh, wasting the Lord's time from the Lord's pulpit beating on each other rather than preaching the gospel? How can we have men and women of God so sure that they've got it all together, they're perfect, and the guy down the street is messed up, and all we're going to do is spend time and talk about them and say that we're right with one another? You know, stop and consider, no, we have been forgiven much. And most of the time, in most cases, when we're not forgiving someone, it's because we don't believe they have asked for forgiveness. They have not apologized. Well, you know, they still don't even realize what they've done. <laughs> oh, yes, they do, because you told everybody in town. And until they get it right with me, then that's, this is going to be my attitude. Hmm. Well, I think you need to go to your mother and get things straightened out, amen? I think you need to go to your brother, your father, your sister, your son, your pastor. <laughs> no, I know nobody's ever had a gross pastor at this church, amen? <laughs> May I tell you, in a very casual, laid-back way, we can, we can chop at and talk about the other guy, and we can have an unforgiving spirit, and it's wrong, and it's sin. If we're going to preach and teach forgiveness, if we're going to celebrate what it means to be forgiven, we better get this part right. Why is forgiveness so essential? Why is it so much a part of what it means to be born again? So that you can now live a life that demonstrates supernatural forgiveness when it comes to your relationship with others. That's what this is all about. Through forgiveness, God enables us to get right with ourselves. May I tell you, I, one of our real problems today is how Satan loves to hold us down. And he knows how to use the right people to do it. <laughs> have you ever felt like you kind of was finally recognizing, look, I know that I have done wrong. I have asked for forgiveness. <coughs> I have gone to the Lord. I've even prayed about it. But there seems to be a few people who aren't going to let me off the hook. And they're not going to let me forget what I've done. Some of us have, even over the last 30 or 40 years of marriage, not let the other one off the hook for something that happened. Some of us are still not letting uh, folks off the hook for something that we can't even remember what they did. But we're sure not going to give in. The truth is, it's not about you letting me off the hook or me letting you off the hook. It's about you confessing sin, taking it to the Lord, making restitution, winning where you can, and moving ahead for the Lord. <coughs> I, that, you know, Satan has got us fooled into believing that you're no longer useful. Now, hey, look, this is no free pass. Don't think that this pastor says that you have not put yourself in a situation where because of some of the things you've done, you will not be able to be used maybe in a certain way. But God is not through with us until we quit breathing. And then we just spend the rest of eternity with no matter where you're at, what you've done, no matter what, you need to look for where God wants to take you. And you need to do what you need to do to get there. Philippians chapter 3, verse 13. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind Amen. and reaching forth unto those things which are before. Amen. You know, i got to tell you, I like the guy who was pulled over by the police officer, and the officer said, hey, listen, fella, you don't have a rear view mirror. 
He says, hey, sir, I'm not worried about where I've been. I'm worried about where I'm going. <laughs> and you know what? I'm not worried about where I've been. I've given it to the Lord. I'm worried about where I'm going. And I'm worried about the next step. I know that the Lord will shine the light that needs to be shined so that I can take the next step. And you know and I know that we may not know the last step, but we know he knows the next step. He knows the last step also, but we can trust him for the next step. Amen. And the first step is to say, yes, Lord, I have sinned. Yes, Lord, I ask for forgiveness. I confess this sin to you. And I'm not going to let Satan do this anymore. No more, no more, no more, no more will I let Satan hold me down this way. Please know this, though. Please don't make this mistake. Don't say, don't think that I'm saying, oh, look, you just keep on serving, you keep on telling people about Jesus, and you just leave that sin unconfessed. Because, you know, you need to be serving the Lord. No, that's wrong, and that's a mistake. As a matter of fact, in certain circles, and I'll tell you, I've seen this happen among independent Baptist brethren, there are some who falsely teach that somehow, some way, if you're leading a certain number of people to the Lord, that will somehow override sin in your life. There are pastors who like to get up and, and, and just preach and preach about, hey, touch not the Lord's anointed. I can't, you can't say anything about me because I'm doing this and I'm doing that. No way in the Bible does it say that if you do all these things, it covers those things. We know that if there is unconfessed sin, if we're continuing in sin, yes, we need to do what the Lord would have us to do. First of all, we need to be broken over it. We need to be grieving over sin. Let's quit laughing about it and joking about it, and let's recognize it for what it is. And then let's give it to the Lord, and let's move ahead. Let's move ahead. Notice, fourthly, through forgiveness... God encourages us to worship with joy. You know and I know this isn't hard to preach. We all know this is the truth. When we have confessed sin, when we have allowed that guiltiness to be washed away because we've given it to him, we rejoice in a greater way. There's nothing like the cleanness, the, the wonderful blessing of knowing that God has forgiven. And you say, yeah, well, that, I remember when I got saved, that was great, and, but you know, I've been falling into sin, and I've struggled, and, and I think God's just tired of me. I'll tell you, that's why God is God, and I'm not. Amen. Because I would be tired of you, and you'd be tired of me. <laughs> you remember hearing what uh, uh, J. Bird McGee said? Folks, if if you really, 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 really knew me, you wouldn't listen to a single word that I preach. And the real fact is, if I really, 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 really knew you, I wouldn't waste my time preaching to you. Amen. We've got to see sin for what it is. We've got to understand that when we come to the Lord and ask for forgiveness, and I've got to believe that today is the day, my friend, don't delay, make it today that you confess that sin to him. When we do that, that changes everything. Our worship changes. Our focus changes. Our thankfulness grows. Our, our humbleness is evident. People see that we are saying, there, but for the grace of God, go I. But thanks be to God, I am forgiven. We know what Satan will do with those of you who struggle with your salvation. Every single time you think a bad thought, every single time you do anything, he says, Aha! <laughs> You're not saved. I told you it was all a lie. I told you you were just trying to talk yourself into something. Now, he'll hope that you'll not just trust the Word of God. He'll hope you'll trust feelings. He'll hope you'll, you'll allow for guilt to cause you to believe that the finished work of Jesus Christ wasn't enough. That Jesus needs to crawl back up on the cross and die all over again. That, that somehow, some way, what you've been taught isn't true. He'll do all that he can do. And he'll do it through sin in your life. And I'm here to say, friend, 
quit questioning your salvation. If you meant it when you prayed it, I'm telling you, if you, uh, 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 I know, I just stepped into a theology 101 class on salvation, but I'm going to make it as clear as I possibly can. When you ask Jesus to come into your heart, did you want it? Of course, if you were trying to get your wife off of your back, if you were trying to impress a few people in town, if you were just saying those same words that you've said over and over and you've never really meant it, of course that's not salvation. But when you said, I know, I'm a sinner, I need you save, to save me, when you prayed that prayer, did you want it? I usually say, did you mean it? But <laughs> you don't mean it if you didn't want it. And so if you wanted it, you meant it. And if you meant it, guess what? You can trust the word of God. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. That's it. But then Satan comes along and says, you know what? You dirty, rotten, you scoundrel, you low down, no good. You still saw that movie you shouldn't have seen. You're still uh, running with the wrong crowd. You still can't seem to get a handle on that smoking. You've got a couple of other things you haven't straightened out. You must not have meant it. And you come groveling back and you pray all over again, you confess all over again, and you keep on doing this and you keep on doing that, and it never works. You got to go back to this. Do you believe the Word of God? Do you believe the Bible? Do you believe it? Because it's not about, it's not about, well, I, 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 maybe I didn't exactly do this right or that right. It's about, did you want Jesus when you asked? And if you wanted him, you got him. You got him. And if you've got him, and there's sin in your life that's now causing you pain and grieving your spirit, get it out of you. Get it out of your system. Get it out of the way. Run from it. And may I tell you, when we do that, God then begins to use us in a greater way. Quickly notice, through forgiveness, God invites us to engage in service. Now, can I just say this? That the word service itself is actually missing in most church services on Sunday morning. We want to talk about the fact that this is the age of grace, and it is. This is the church age, and we're thankful for it. But I'll tell you, when you fully appreciate, when you get a handle on it, and you're holding on to what it means to be saved, what it means to be forgiven, you want to serve him. You'll want to serve him. You have confessed sin. You're not allowing yourself to continue to struggle in those areas that continue to have their way with you. You want to serve. You want to serve him. Isaiah chapter 6 verse 8 says, Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I. Send me. We preached this last Wednesday Sunday night. And we were reminded that Isaiah had to confess sin before he did that. <laughs> he was not where he needed to be. Remember, he said, I am sinful and I serve <laughs> sinful people. And he understood that he needed to quit looking at them and he needed to look at him. And he needed to see the Lord for who he was and it would make all the difference. I'll tell you what, after we experience this cleansing, there is a gratitude that takes place, just as we see in Isaiah, that causes us to say, here I am, send me. Here I am. Here I am, Lord. Here I am. Send me. No, 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 I'm not going to wait for somebody to ask me. I'm not, I don't have to be talking to it. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go. I want to go. That's what happens. Right. Through forgiveness, God fills our hearts with hopes and dreams of heaven. I'll tell you, I have said this before, and I realize it today. There will come a time, and it has for me, and it will for you, when you will realize. And, you know, I can tell you, I don't know when that time is. You will realize that there are, you've got more years behind you than you may have ahead of you on this side of eternity. And it causes you to stop and appreciate in a greater way what it means to look forward to glory. There might be some today who say, well, wait, 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 
Ah, come on. That's not even on my horizon. I'm a young person. That's not something I'm that concerned about. I know you guys want us to say, yeah, amen. What a blessing it is to talk about heaven. And I'm sure that the last thing on the parents of those 20 precious children in Connecticut a few weeks ago was that glory, that heaven would be right at their door. I gotta tell you something. It's never too early to set your sights, set your heart, fix your focus on glory, because that's really what this is all about. This is just a short little period of time that we're gonna to spend together. It doesn't take very, very, very long before, just as Will was saying, you look back, I mean, uh, I know he only looks 16, but he has been out of high school for 20 years. I'm telling you, time will fly, it will go by. But for some of us, we don't know. We can't have any confidence that we are promised tomorrow. John chapter 14. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there ye may be. Friends, I know it's a whole nother message, and we'll not have time today to rejoice in all that it means to spend all of eternity with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, but there's nothing in this world that can even begin to compare to what that really means. No, it will not be boring. No, it will not be something that, that, that just is uh, anything you can compare to anything that happens today. I, I'll give you my, as we close with this, I'll give you my best illustration of what glory is. Are you ready for this? Stop right now. Think about the very sweetest, most precious moment that you've ever had with the Lord. Whether it be in a conversation with another brother or sister, in prayer with the Lord, uh, in what the Lord was doing in your spirit and in your heart. Think of the very, very best, the very, very best moment that you can think of. And that's a very, that's a small glimpse into what eternity is right there. That's what heaven is. That's what we're looking forward to. The very, very best moment that you've ever had with the Lord on this side of eternity is a small glimpse into what eternity is all about. And I'll tell you, I can't think of how much more important today it is to preach and teach the gospel, the good news, and don't leave out forgiveness. Don't leave it out when you're witnessing and don't leave it out in your life today. And if you're here today and there's some things that you know you need to give to the Lord, don't delay. Don't delay. Do it today. Let's all stand.